back up here. Um, I hope everybody had their coffee, because I'm going to go right into it. Nothing but code. Uh, now, actually, I'm going to start with some actually fuzzier, more philosophical questions, and then I'll hit you with the code. Um, Yesterday, we, we had a couple analogies between writing software and being a wizard, writing, making magic, right? And it's a very common analogy, right? It's kind of funny, and people say it a lot, and we kind of get why it sounds true. Um, but when you actually sit down and think about that analogy, it keeps looking stronger and stronger and stronger, right? The archetype of magic throughout cultures across history is that you can actually make things happen just by knowing the right incantation, right? And that's actually what we do for a living. Okay. So software really is kind of magic. And as more and more of the stuff in the world runs software, and more and more of every aspect of our social lives is mediated by software, our magic is seeping out into everything. Right? And so we kind of have superpowers. And our powers are growing. And so like any good hero story with superpowers, you have to point, you reach the point where you have to ask, are you going to use your powers for good or evil, right? Uh, are we going to do that? Um, and so the way I, I answer that question is, it actually kind of depends who's the we we're talking about, right? Who's going to have the power to wield software going into the future where software runs everything, right? Is it going to be something that stays in the hands of a tiny elite cast of people who know the incantations, or is it something that can grow? Is it something that we can spread so that the world stays a bit of a more even place, so that uh, everybody has a shot at wielding the, the magic that runs the world, right, to stand up for their own point of view. So, um, so I see this as one of the most important things we can work on as technologists, is to think about the question, how do we reduce that gap between where the software is today and where most of the people in the world are with respect to software? It's, there's a big gap, right? There's some really depressing statistics about uh, some surveys people have done of actually like conducting tests of random people off the street in a whole variety of countries um, on their computer skills. And the very highest level of skill was basically somebody who could switch from screen to screen like three times and get through a task. And it was 5% in, in all the like rich countries of the world, it was like 5% was the best uh, of people who can like stay on task to get through three different screens. So I, I think that's an indictment of the interface technologies we have, and the hope for the future is be that we can do better. But so the, the, so the gap is large. Uh, now, the good news is every little bit of improvement we make helps immensely. Right? There's a lot of orders of magnitude between where we are now and the whole world. And going up by one order of magnitude is a massive change. It changes everything. Right? So making uh, you know, the existence of the web and JavaScript is one example of that. It has empowered a massively broader set of people to get into what we do. It's a good thing. Uh, and Ember itself, this should all be sounding familiar to you because Ember is about this, right? It's about empowering people to do things they couldn't do before. Um, it's not, you know, it's about, yes, it's also about making uh, people who are already programmers faster at their jobs, happier at their jobs. But that's, um, the, the, the bigger, longer-term effect is that you actually get things happening that weren't going to happen before. Things get built that couldn't have been built before. People get involved who didn't have an opportunity to be involved before. So, so, the top, so my topic today is, how do we do that? How do we grow to empower wider audiences of people? Because we've got really special stuff here. We've got amazingly powerful capabilities. So yesterday, uh, yesterday started with an awesome talk about the continuum from Really small, uh, really small situations, small applications with less features, and the continuum up from there to bigger applications with more features, right? I think we're pretty familiar with the, the concept. I think we have a good sense for how we fill this continuum and how you NPM install your way up from Glimmer to Ember. Like it's, it's a very compelling story. I'm very excited to see what everybody goes out and builds with this stuff as the Ember community grows down this continuum into the small niches in addition to the big ones, we're, we're already very successful. Um, I want to talk today about the other end of the continuum. Because if you spend all your time in JavaScript land, it's easy to forget that the web is actually still dominated by platforms that have a lot more features than any JavaScript framework. And they empower a much wider set of people to use them, which is why they're so successful. So I'm talking about things like WordPress, like Joomla, like Drupal, right? 
they're, all, they're each different and they fall on slightly different parts of this continuum, but all of them are much more out of the box products than, than programming environments, right? They are absolutely for programmers, and anybody doing really serious projects in any of those has programmers working on them, but they're also for people who are not programmers, right? They can serve people who are themers, people who are site builders, people who are content creators, can all have a seat at the table and participate, and then because they're all participating in one ecosystem, more things can happen, right? New things get built, and this helps people level up their skills because when you get a whole bunch of people of disparate skill all working in the same ecosystem, sitting at the same table, it's a chance for a lot of cross-pollination. So that's the real secret of success in these ecosystems. Um, and they are huge, and they are not going away, right? They're, very, they're big and successful. What they don't have is they're, they're not built for the modern web platform architecture, right? So uh, also from yesterday's talk, we heard how much the web has changed even in five years, right? And we, we talk about needing to make sure that we keep our architecture relevant to the web, but we're a youngin compared to these platforms, right? They have an architecture that's way older and has way more legacy problems than, than we do. Like, we're in really good shape. We are built for the modern web, uh, and like Glimmer is a very modern web thing. It, it's much harder if you have a massive ecosystem of stuff that is all locked to the server-side languages and doesn't have rationalized primitives, and so they have a challenge, right? Um, to the extent that these platforms are shipping Ember-like features, they're doing it by like doing small chunks of stuff in a, in a front-end framework, but it's, it's, they can't bridge the gap with their vast ecosystem that already exists on the server. So we have a real opportunity here, and the reason Ember in particular has an opportunity here is because of uh, three points. One is HTML, and Ember has been, from the beginning, very self-consciously focused on the web is about HTML, users, a, a very large set of people can learn to be proficient in HTML. It is, it's, the, it's a good level of power for the, for the task that it does without too much power. It's not a full Turing complete programming language. It's a principle of least power. It does what it does, and it does it pretty well, and it's an accepted consensus that lets you do a lot of things, right? Our templates are deliberately just a well-reasoned superset of HTML, and that's a really powerful thing. It's been one of the most successful decisions about Ember, it's what allows us to have evolved so far in terms of the underlying platform and still kept the continuity of the, the people, the applications, and the, uh, you know, it, it's actually shocking how, how well templates have aged, right? Uh, way better than typical JavaScript code because it's principle of least power, right? They just declare what they want, they don't say how they're gonna get it. So HTML is one of our strengths, in particular when compared to things that are just JavaScript because that's too much power for a templating language, and it means that you're locked into everything, all the semantics of JavaScript and you can never change them. We have our own, we control the whole programming language in, in, our, template, in our templates, right? We can, change the, we can change how things work under the hood. Our second point is our add-on ecosystem, and I think everybody appreciates that that's one of the strongest things about our community, and also appreciates that it's only possible because we get enough people to agree right, on strong standards. This is, an, this is absolutely a prerequisite to kind of dip your toes into this space of serving broader audiences of people. The, whole re the biggest economic reason people use platforms like a WordPress or a Drupal is because it has a great cost to benefit, right? You need your site up, developers are very expensive. Right? And it's, you're gonna need some, but isn't it great if you can only focus that expensive effort on the few things that are unique about you and offload a whole lot of other stuff to a community? Like, that sounds like the pitch for Ember. That's exactly what we do, right? It's just a question of thinking bigger and trying to offload more and more to the community and share more pieces. And so, and the third piece, of course, is that community. It's a community that actually invests in shared standards. It's not, a, it's not something you see everywhere, uh, especially in JavaScript, although the world, like, we are slowly dragging the world along to uh, agreeing on more things. And it's always gratifying to see uh, ideas and consensus efforts that come out of Ember slipping into things like the actual JavaScript language, like our impact on things like promises and all the feedback on uh, ECMA standards and all that. So we get, the, we get the process, right? The process is important and people value it and that's actually a really precious thing. So those are our, our three uh, reasons why I think Ember is in, in a position to go move up this end of the continuum and do more out of the box. So Ember as it stands is, 
is, uh, it's a perfectly clear message that it's for programmers and for building ambitious applications. I'm not suggesting we change that. I'm suggesting we're gonna build on top. And so I wanna talk today about introducing uh, the card stack application architecture. And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna take the approach actually focus on this audience of starting with a completely stock Ember app and gradually adding capabilities up so that you get more and more out of the box that you don't have to have implemented in your application. So, um, so that's, you know, that's my approach for pitching this to an Ember audience. The goal of course is that all these pieces that I'm showing you are things that you could actually put together into a holistic starter kit experience that's a one-click install and you could actually say, I want a website and boom, have a website that is interactive, that is based on Ember's architectural principles. So, I'm gonna start with a demo app here that's just based off of data scraped off the Ember Count speakers list. If you saw me talk two years ago, I did basically the same trick, uh, only that time I was talking about animations. Um, oh, and incidentally, I should do a shout out. So the, I wasn't here last year, and uh, the reason was that uh, my son was being born literally during like the opening keynote. And uh, so he's turning one today, so I have to have a shout out to Arthur. Hopefully he's watching on the live stream. So um, we're gonna take this basic app and we're gonna do Ember add card stack tools. Okay, so this is the first of a series of Ember add-ons we're gonna talk about adding to our application and we're gonna get more functionality as we go. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap my top level outlet in the card stack tools, right? And that's gonna give me some new things. What I've got is actually a tiny little launcher up here in the right hand corner that's gonna let me pull in the tool set, right? Now, don't panic, there's a lot going on here, but we're gonna take it apart piece by piece, and what you're gonna see is that all of these things are just components, and you already know how components work, and how to mix and match them and make them be what you need in your app without the parts that you don't. So, the first thing I wanna do to make this nicer is, you'll, you may have noticed when it, when it plays and animates, my content is reflowing. Um, like, I used to have three images across, and now I only have two. So, because out of the box, we're not trying to force any particular markup onto you, right? So, but I have a lot of options for how to deal with this. The, the primitives here are designed to be very uh, isolatable and composable. So, just as one example, I'm gonna drop in a little bit of styling around my outlet inside the card stack tools to change the way that behaves. And so, if my stuff has a, has a fixed size, it's gonna react differently to the tools. Now it slides over instead of crushing. Right, so now we lose Yehuda off the side, but at least we don't wrap. So, okay, minor improvement. Let's, let's add another off-the-shelf piece, right? So here's another completely separate add-on, and it's a completely single-purpose focused add-on that does one thing. All it is is a component that knows how to take its initial size and then scale itself whenever the available space changes. So it's just another thing you could use right away in a number app. Uh, drop, here we are putting it in. So we're gonna drop our squishable, con squishable container in. And we're gonna have a nicer, nicer experience of activating the tools that are gonna edit our application. Right, so it's a pretty nice, pretty nice feeling. Uh, so we'll stick with that one. Now I wanna dive, I'm gonna take you down deeper into what we're looking at here. This is the whole implementation template-wise of the card stack tools. Uh, in fact, it's basically the whole implementation because there's not really much going on in the JavaScript side. So there's not a whole lot of pieces here that you'd have to think about and manage. There's actually components coming from two different places. There is a couple card stack specific things, which is the tools launcher. That's the little button component that you could put where you want to put it to launch these, the tools. And I've got a, uh, a card stack header and a card stack toolbox. Those are both components. That's what you see coming down from the top, coming in from the right. The toolbar manager, and the fixed within toolbars and the in top, in right toolbar, that's a whole nother add-on. And it's one you can use right away to do all kinds of very general purpose toolbars in an application. It's called Ember Toolbars. It has its own little demo that shows how it works. And it knows how to dyna adapt dynamically based on however big your content is of the components that you wanna put in a sidebar on either side, on the top, on the bottom, they can combine. And it shows you the different strategies for how you can accommodate the space. Right, so this is just a, Again, general purpose Lego blocks that we can all build up with. So, prerequisites to building sophisticated interactive experiences. All right, so let's look at our, my detail page and what the tools are telling me. Right now they say no editable content. 
So I wanna make my content editable by card stack. I need to annotate my content a bit so that it knows that there's some interactive stuff that it's supposed to be able to edit. And so I'm taking my template for my route, which used to just have a bunch of HTML, and I drop in instead a call to the, car, the card stack content renderer. Right? And all that, and the reason for this is that every piece of content is a component. It seems like a reasonable assumption, and so I needed to make one, and there's a conventional place to put the component that represents a particular page. So I, I'm moving, I move the template over, and I invoke it, and I rename model to content, because within a content card, you have content, and that's what it's called when you write your template. So now the framework actually sees, when, when this page renders, it detects that we have rendered a, a piece of content that is of type speaker, and it has guessed a description based on the attributes of it, of Yehuda. So like, the toolbar is, is now context aware that the, of that, that's the content on this page that it found. It also says that this content is live and published on the site. Right? And we'll get into the other alternatives uh, as we get further into the talk. So the next thing I'm gonna do is actually make some of the fields in here uh, editable by the CMS. So we'll start with the name. And so all I'm gonna do is drop in a component here called CS field, short for card stack field. And so instead of saying content.name, I'm gonna invoke it as a card stack field. Now this step is one where I have ambitions to make this completely transparent. We already have great infrastructure for template pre-processing, and I think that we can do a very Spartan kind of custom component that already, that does this rewriting step for you, so that simply by writing Curly's name, you get this effect, right? Um, so the effect is pretty cool though, right? When you, uh, the animation played kind of fast, let me go through it here. As you, you what we've, the, the editing tools have detected in the sidebar here that there's a name field that's appearing. I can mouse over it there and it's actually gonna highlight it in the page, right, the blue box labeled with name, right? As I move my mouse on and off, it'll highlight it or go away, right? Also, it, if I go over to actually interact with the page, it'll highlight and I can open it up from there. And when I actually click on it and, or activate the editor, it's gonna highlight that one field for me and it's gonna bring up the field editor for that in the right hand side. And it actually comes up with a message right now saying no such field editor for the field editor string, right? So geez, it seems like a field editor for string should be a standard thing that would come with a framework like this. So let's go ahead and ember add cards.core types. Right? We're building up, we're NPM installing our way up the, the continuum. So now when we do it, we have an editor there that knows how to edit strings, and I can go in and edit it. Now this, this design is, has been fairly carefully thought out, and we, this is extracted from applications that myself, uh, Christy, Hassan, a bunch of folks here who have worked under the Cardstack banner have done uh, as kind of projects for clients, always with, the, always with the understanding that our goal was to build this open source thing that we could take out. And what you're seeing is the result of, of a lot of that evolution and hard work on the design side and the, and the technology side. So um, now we have this nice editable string thing. Great, let's do more. So next I'm gonna just do a simple thing for the photo. Um, um, what I'm showing here is that the CS field can be used in a block form, which, is, which just gives you the pure value Right, it's not gonna render it for you, you're gonna do whatever you want with it, and in this case, we're gonna bind it to the, the source of an image. So I can, this is letting me mark up any arbitrary chunk of the page as belonging to that field, and then I can put whatever I want in there, and now that is highlightable by the CMS, it knows that I have a photo URL field in there, it knows where it belongs, and, I, and it's still a string editor, so I can come in here and edit it with the string editor, right? This is okay, this is nice. Um, I have, not in this open source version yet, I didn't get quite get there, we've got a much more interactive um, image uploader, media plugin, prop it, in, prop it right in the page kind of thing. Uh, that's on the kind of coming soon list. Uh, but, uh, but it exists already, and so it's like not a big stretch to get it into the open source version. Um, so cool, right, we got these block form ones. What this means is now you can still use all the component toolkit you know, right? All these values that are coming out of the CMS, you can send them into whatever component you want. You've already got, sophisticated components for rendering this stuff, great. Just mark them up in the block form, and what you're getting is really, that, 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 comp that CS field component doesn't render any output, right? It doesn't alter your DOM as it appears on the page. All it's doing is letting the, the card stack tools, when they're activated, find exactly what part of the DOM uh, your content's in so that we can know where to put it and interact with it. So let's do, let's do the body now, right? So right, if you look at my template here, actually, I'm doing something very bad, and if you paid attention to Ingrid's talk yesterday, you know why it's bad. Right? Um, this is content I scraped literally from the website and the bios have links and stuff in them so I kept it as HTML. 
And so to render it, I needed triple curlies, which means if we actually let the users edit this stuff, our, our site is now vulnerable. So that's bad. But there's a much better way that could still let us preserve all of our rich structure. That's mobile doc, right? Shout out to uh, the guys from 201 Created who put a lot of effort into making mobile doc happen. Uh, if you're not familiar with mobile doc, it is a format for doing rich, rich text editing on the web and, and, and on other platforms. It's mobile because it's portable to many kinds of rendering in many places. Um, but if we add the Ember mobile doc plugin, what we're adding now is a, is a cardstock field type. And here I'm gonna, I'm gonna manually go into my model and add a new field called bio and I'm gonna say that it's a, a field type cardstock mobile doc. Now I can drop that in to my template and the tools are gonna pick that up. And we're gonna grab some markups so that it looks like the other, other one. And I'm still leaving the old bio there because I want the content still so I can see it. All right, so this is a good point to point out that there's this editor on off switch in the top and that's really important. It turns out in the UX of this whole experience because your content, um, you actually can still navigate your site while you're editing it and you navigate like a regular user, right? You're not away on some admin page looking through a list of content. You're actually clicking links in your content to get around the site. So you need to make a distinction between when you're clicking to move around and interact with your content and when you're clicking to edit your content, right? So, and here we're demonstrating a really neat feature that just comes straight out of the box with mobile doc, which is if you cut and paste HTML from the web into mobile doc, it actually maintains things like links and italics and bold without taking any of the stuff you don't want, like the styles and the colors and the script tags. Uh, so, it's very powerful. Um, here I'm demonstrating some of the basic stuff it can do, and also the fact that we've got a nice little um, navigator on the right-hand side that comes up when you're editing that mobile doc so that you can know where you are in the structure of a document. Um, this is an example of a field type plugin. Right? Now, you basically already know how to make one of those because it's an Ember add-on that provides some components. There's just some conventions around how they're named so we could find them and apply them in these situations. So there's a, um, this, this one actually uses all three kinds of components that a field can do. One of them is the field editor, which is the, the, yeah, the field editor which is on the right hand side, uh, which is in the case of a mobile lock just shows us a list of the sections. There's an inline editor that you can use actually on top of the content. That's what gives you enough room to do the rich text editing here. And then there's, lastly, there's the default renderer, which is what actually renders on the page if, no, if you don't use the block form. If you use the block form, you can get this actual doc, the actual document structure and do what you want with it, right? But if you just drop CS field bio here, we go find the default renderer component and put it in, right? So lots of power, lots of flexibility, and now, um, you know, anybody who's shipping new capabilities can ship them as field plugins and do a lot, do a lot with them. So, those nice blue boxes uh, are another general purpose abstraction that's not tied to any of the rest of this. So if you check out Ember Overlays, they uh, have a nice little demo that shows how, this, how they work. They have a pretty simple protocol that lets you, there's a marker component that you put into your DOM, the places where you might want to highlight things and there's an overlay component that can target those, and there's a lot of options to actually get the UX right and get the layout right so that things can flow correctly to match the size of your content and can react to motion in the right times and the right ways. Um, there's a, another very powerful little primitive that um, just falls out of having to build those kind of ambitious experiences, right? Um, so this is one you can go and use right away if you want, and it's, of course it's programmatic too, so if you want to like, have an, an annotated tour through your application, mark up some locations, run a script, like, but use Ember concurrency probably, run that script, to step through turning things on, right, and you can guide people through your application. It's very powerful. Okay. So, um, up until now, we have, um, we've been changing our model, right, but we haven't been saving it because we don't have a server, right. So, my little blue button here turns, my button here turns blue when there's things to save and now we know our model is dirty. Um, but if you click it, it'll just try to like host the non-existent place right now, right? We, I don't have a setup. Uh, this is just, these are, these are Ember data models, but I don't have an adapter or anything set up, and I don't have a server, right? And so if we think about taking Ember out of the box and making it something that you can just use, um, geez, we're really missing a server, right? Um, so that's part, of the, that's part of the pitch here. The goal is to have a stock server. So we're gonna Ember add Cardstack Hub and Cardstack Git. And so, and I'll go into the architecture a little bit about why there are these two pieces. It's because Hub is a, 
It's a general purpose thing, server for fusing other data sources. It doesn't actually store canonically any data of its own. It exists to be the layer that bridges together every crazy source of data that your application needs into one place that can present a pristine, beautiful, standards compliant, conventions compliant API out to your apps. Uh, and do that all in a consistent way that follows the same authentication, right, no matter where your data is coming from. So in this example, I'm installing the card tag git data source plugin, and that uses, as a canonical store, it uses git. It turns out that's an extremely powerful way to get going, and it's actually, for a certain class of your data, like your actual config and your schema and all the things that run your server, git is a great place for it, obviously. Um, I think we appreciate, when we're working in code, like we, we get why we would use a git-based workflow. It's the only way we're able to collaborate at scale uh, to be able to keep track of all, all the things in flight on a, on a big project. Um, what you find in a lot of uh, projects that are involved with code and content and configuration is that there are a lot of rough impedance mismatches between the folks who are working in the code workflow, the folks who are working in the content workflow, the folks who are, ch and the, the changes to configuration that break one or both of those things, right? When everybody's not in the same world, working in the same patterns, uh, you miss a lot of opportunities. Uh, both in terms of just the sheer efficiency of your project and the sharing of ideas and figuring out good ways, but also in terms of leveling up people across the team and across an organization. Um, so when, when we use Cardstack Git, um, when we post data to our JSON API server, that's a commit. We get to say what branch it goes on, and we get all of the semantics of Git to make sure that, we, that it can be merged safely with other things. And if things can't be merged safely, you already know how to resolve, resolve merge conflicts, right? And so things bottom out in kind of no worse than the world you have now, but as we, as we build up the tools, more and more of these things get to be surfaced through nice interfaces. And I've dropped in the bottom here some of the other kinds of backends. Um, all of these are things we've actually already shipped with client projects and want to ship as plugins to the Cardstack Hub. Um, the general idea of writing one of these plugins is it's not, they're not that hard. Um, and the, the secret to it is that the hub is a fast cache for all your stuff. So your indexers can only have to be near real time. Uh, the hub uses Elasticsearch as its, as its ephemeral cache store of all the, all, as much stuff as you can suck out of all your, of your upstream data sources as you want to, you can throw into Elasticsearch, it's, it's battle hardened, it's uh, scaled out horizontally. You can stuff an awful lot of stuff in it. This gives you a huge capabilities to ship new ambitious things in organizations who think their, their data is just horribly locked up behind legacy systems, behind systems that are too slow, too cumbersome, too hard to access safely, right? All that stuff uh, is what the hub was designed to solve. It's just something that falls out naturally if you try to take on enough of these projects. You realize that the Decisions on, for example, who can edit what piece of stuff uh, end up depending on some facts that are stored in some random SQL server and some other facts that are stored in some enterprise management system. And you've got to put those all together somehow right at the front end point where you're serving data out to the web. Um, and you need that place to exist. And that's what the Cardstack Hub exists to do. So now that I installed that add-on, I'm actually gonna, uh, first thing I'm gonna do is actually hit an API endpoint right on Ember CLI. This is my Ember CLI app, localhost 4200, like always. Um, in dev, the heart, heart step hub, hub knows, is an Ember add-on. It knows how to mount itself into the middleware of Ember CLI. And it, it, by default, it puts itself under the name card stack. And so what I did right here is I hit the content types endpoint. Now, that's a little inception-y. Oh, I'm hitting my microphone, sorry. Um, what I, one of the things that I think is exciting about the architecture here is that this, is, this server is JSON API all the way to the bottom. Uh, in fact, the, only, the way you configure it is you actually make like a, a tiny list of seed models that are the, just enough configuration to go find where am I supposed to get the rest of my configuration, and everything is models that are model, you know, resources, JSON API resources. So your schema, you know, your list of contents, your content types, your fields, what their types are, which plugins are activated, constraint rules on your data, right? Which things can't be null, which things have a length limit. Those, those are all just things that you can post case an API to change, right? So that means that you already know how to build sophisticated UIs that work against JSON API. You can build sophisticated UIs to control all this stuff, and that's the opportunity we have, to build 
like the best CMS experience anybody's ever seen. Uh, the so the asset types that came back here, there's seven, like seven of them that went by as you watch the animation. There are things like uh, grants, right? These are the rules about who can re who can read and write what. There's uh, the fields themselves. There's the at the default values, things you can store that are just defaults in terms of like if the user doesn't set a value, what goes there. Uh, data sources. This is your actual list of whether this is, this is like which Git repos do I use, in which environments, which databases do I use, how do I get to, how do I talk to them. All that's configurable here. So it turns out like this is not a framework for writing server applications. This is an application and it's got config to drive all this stuff and a really rich NPM based plugin system to do the rest. Uh, so let's let's make the content type we need for our demo app, right? We we have a speaker page that we want to be able to save. We need to make a speaker content type. So if you're familiar with JSON API, this is just a very normal looking JSON API request. We're going to post the content types endpoint. I want to make a new content type. Uh, I'm going to give it the ID of speakers, and I'm going to give it these fields. Right? So we'll submit that, and it won't work because the point of this is more to talk about uh, good error messages. So it's saying I have a broken field reference. Speakers refers to missing field name. Right. Oh, I guess I need to define my names before I define my content type. Makes sense. This is these are basically dangling pointers, right? Uh, the goal, the the point here is that the good error message off, off an API server are incredibly valuable, and so everything is designed here to try to do that. The um, there's nothing more frustrating than just like requests that fail and don't tell you why, and then you have to like continually add and remove one property at a time when you try to talk to the server and see which one it's mad about. Uh, so the goal is to not have to do that. So we can define some types. Let's make a, a, a name that's a string. Now you can actually see the field type here is defined in terms of one of my plugins, cards.core types we saw earlier. We thought we were just adding Ember components to do field editors. But it turns out that, that component can do, has server-side plugin capabilities too. This is, the, this is the other kind of aha piece. We know all the good things that come when, you, when add-ons have a standard way of adding capabilities to an application. Add-ons have a standard way to give you styles, to give you components, to give you services, all that stuff that you might need. Uh, well, these add-ons have a standard way to give you server-side validations, uh, deep text search indexing for your type, uh, constraints, new data sources, right? So think about what you can do with Ember add-on that does that, right? Think about if you, if you run a service that is an API for the developers, how you can actually ship uh, like out of the box experiences that used to take custom development for people to integrate with your capabilities, or they can just drop that into an Ember app and it, their server will now all of a sudden know how to talk to you as a data server. Uh, here we are making the mobile lock field. Again, this is referring to the card stack mobile lock plugin. We installed it earlier to get the Ember components. It turns out it has capabilities on the server side too. It knows how to validate the mobile lock. It knows how to render it down to text so that the full text search works within it even though it's a kind of a rich structure, it's not just text. Uh, we could do relationships, we'll, we'll say the tags are it belongs to. And finally we could post our speakers and it works. So now we have an actual content type and we could post a speaker. We'll, we'll make the first speaker, we'll give it an ID so that we know what ID it's got and it's a nice short one. Um, that's all, you can You can choose to manage IDs how you want to. The out of the box setting actually does use, like, basically get like uh, SHAs as its IDs and that has some really nice properties when we, we're gonna talk about branching your site. Uh, but here we are posting, uh, making our first piece of content, and it, it comes back with a 200, and it gives me back meta, uh, which is a standard JSON API feature that lets you have put things that aren't standard, and I get back very Git-looking SHAs here for version and hash, and that's that's enough information there for me to be able to take this record into my application, manipulate it, send it back, and let Git do the normal Git merge thing, right? It knows what commit I came from. Uh, and it knows it can actually do merges the way Git would normally do merges. And as long as you didn't touch something that somebody else touched, even if lots of other stuff happened around you, you get all that merging capability happening in your server. And if it doesn't work, you get a 409 conflict, right? Which is kind of what you want. So um, to show off more of these capabilities, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead and add some more of the capability uh, by adding the card stack routing plugin. So. This is what do you do when you, you realize all your routes are getting really boring because all they do is call the card stack content component and all they do is load a model that has a type and an ID or, or a slug, right? Like basically sometimes you want pretty IDs, right? A lot of times sites are designed for that. So the, the default out of the box thing here is searching by slug 
and a content type. So you realize your routes are really boring, and you should just delete them and mount the card stack routes. So let's do that. So I'm going to import card stack routes. I can, they're just something I can put anywhere in my router map. If I just wanted to route them under, say, slash C and have all the card stack routes there, I could do that. Um, or in this case, I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to say, let's just take over the whole map, router map and just use them there. Right? Now, um, now, if people are familiar with Ember engines, you might say, this looks very engine-y. Uh, maybe we could use a mount here. And I think that's a good idea. Um, there's a few features in engine that I want to push forward to make that more of a possibility. Uh, what engines are really great at today is helping you break up your application into, into pieces that, like a core app and many engines, all of which are authored by you. But to make a general purpose third party engine like this one as configurable as you want it to be, uh, we need some more features that engines don't have, particularly around ways to essentially yield back to the application so that things like your components can show up as content inside of these routes. So, but today it's actually very simple. Um, this is the whole implementation of card stack routes, right? All I'm doing is defining these four routes. It's actually five because there's always an implicit index route and we do use it. Um, we use that good old reset namespace feature, which means now we know exactly where our, what our routes to be named no matter where you put it. And um, we've got new content, content, and default content, and card stack. So we, you just get a very straight up, boring, on purpose, set of routes that you didn't have to think about, right? And, but they come with a couple extra things. Uh, and so what I'm gonna show here is that the, the routes are sensitive to the, a branch parameter. So your whole site can render uh, taking a, a branch parameter, that goes through all the API requests to the server and the server understands it. The git backend will literally use a branch. So everything that powers your site, keep in mind that's not just your content, and your, that's your code, your content, your schema, your config, is all forked. So now you can actually, on one site, change any of those things, make a new branch, run the site with that URL, and you have a completely different experience. And so now this empowers whole new ways of collaborating in teams, right? Um, all of a sudden, a developer and a designer or a content author can put their heads together, make a branch, collaborate on it um, in real time, and have something, have an extremely flexible natural workflow for getting that stuff uh, in front of other people, getting their feedback, getting their input in their changes, and then getting it merged, right? So right now there's not a UI for doing the merge step. Um, but let's, so, and uh, I'm gonna go in a little bit slow and just point out some of the things that made it run by fast in the animation. So, um, our site starts out in live mode where you're just seeing what's on the site. Um, but when I go into editing, I had this particular demo set up to, to forbid editing on the live branch. It always sends you over to a draft branch. Uh, and so this, this, in this particular example, it's set up with just two branches, draft and live. Um, but of course, you know, you want to make a new branch, that's just another JSON API code away if you've got the, if you've got the, the permissions. Um, so we're able to switch to preview, and at first, the preview content says it's the same as the live version. Right? We know that because of those hashes that come back off of, off of the server in the metadata. Um, so this is literally, we know it's the same because Git hashes that whole tree of data to the same sum. Um, so then I go and make some changes, and I, when I save them, I've saved it to my branch, so now I have, now I've got a, this, this nice red color is there. It's intended to always tell you you're in preview mode. You'll notice we're not using the word branch here in the UI. Um, the whole goal here is to come up with sensible design to make this really approachable. So the, the terminology that we're, we're working with tentatively for users is, is, is previews, right? I wanna make a new preview of the site. Let's collaborate on a preview of the site, and then let's get it merged into the rest of the site. So, now we know we differ from the live version. I can still click over to the live version and I see that the content changes, right? I'm switching between versions of my site, between the live published and the preview that differs from published. So I can go and uh, edit some more things. And then I'll go look at my Git repo and I have the commits that way I mean. Like I hit update two times, so I got two commits. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any auth turned on right now, so I'm labeled as anonymous coward. Um, if you look closely at the, the Git, uh, it's actually using Git's features around tracking both the author and the committer separately, because the committer is the server uh, with its process ID and its host name, and the, the author is the actual end user who was logged in if they weren't logged in. Um, and here's their changes, right? And you can see that what they changed is literally files in the repo that are JSON that is actually just uh, JSON API, right? You can actually see the structure here. It's that, uh, 
you know, this was speaker zero, right? That's the type, that's the ID, and here's the attributes. And if there were any uh, relationships, they'd be there too. So you already know this structure. You could dive right into this repo and debug something because it's just stuff you already know. So let's merge it to master. And now when we come to our site, we're gonna see that the live and preview both reflect our changes, right? That was the, that's the workflow. Um, now it's the same as the live version. Great, so now, thank you, yeah. So now we've got, um, let's, let's, do some add, let's do some adding and removing, because we want the full CRUD experience, right? We want the create and the delete too. Um, that's part of the pitch of adding the routes, right? There's a lot of little things you have to think about when you make all these routes. In particular, there's a bunch of transitions you have to think about in a situation like this. When I make a new piece of content, I really want to route somewhere to do it. Uh, so I need, so that little button that says add needs to know where is it that I route to when I want to make a new speaker, right? And so by using the standard routing plugin, and like this, you know, this component is able to just, this menu of what types do I want to add, is just powered by hitting that same API we looked at, right? It knows how to look at the list of content types. Um, in, in particular, it's filtering down by the ones that are user created ones, not the like stock ones. So I don't have the schema editors in here. Um, but I can go and add a speaker and it's gonna take me to the right route, which is my content new route. And it switched me to branch draft because that's the rule on this site. Um, you'll notice here that my field editors are showing placeholder content. That's another thing that all those plugins can do. So the string plugin doesn't have any special behavior. It doesn't really care. And so the default thing is that it actually just renders saying enter, enter your end field name. Uh, that's kind of important because if you, you'll see if you turn the editor off. Oh, I can't actually click on it, it's a video. <laughs> Oh, I could use some sleep. I do have a one-year-old, yeah. Um, so if you, turn the, if you turn the preview off and there's blank fields, you'll notice, they'll, you'll see there's nothing in them, right? They just kind of disappear. And so to know where they are, it's really nice to have placeholder content. So that's why there's a protocol for fields to do that. Something like MobileDoc needs a slightly smarter protocol because a MobileDoc has a structure. You can't just throw any random thing in there and expect it to render. So the MobileDoc plugin implements a hook that knows how to test is this content empty because it turns out an empty mobile doc doesn't look empty to JavaScript, right? It's still got hojos and stuff. So it can test if it's empty and if it is, it knows how to render that placeholder content. Um, and you can do the same, think about using the same thing for things like images, right? Making sure there's automatically the placeholder image there is just a very simple hook in your image, in the image field plugin, right, that you wanna implement. All right, so let's add a new speaker, Jen, because she's next after me. Um, now, I, this is because I added a new record, I'm on the preview branch. If I switch to the live branch, oh, there's no, there's no such speaker, right? Not on live, it hasn't been pushed there yet. So you'll see the routes are also doing this for me. They're letting me have appropriate error handling so that I can actually stay on the right URL. It'll show me my 404 page, um, and then I could toggle back to preview and say that actually on the preview version of the site, this isn't a 404, there's stuff here. Right. I can actually go back to my other existing uh, speaker here, right? He's on both branches, but if I delete him off, off preview, I get this opposite behavior, right? Now on live, he's still there, but on preview, he's gone, right? So now when we merge this change, he's out, she's in. Uh, so this is just a lot of the tiny details that uh, chip away at your mental budget for thinking about an application, your actual budget for how long it takes to build. Uh, things that, to the extent that we can find these shared solutions, and extract them from real experiences so that they're really bulletproof abstractions that work for a large number of people, like this is the pitch, right? We wanna work on these things together and get them really solid. Uh, so, I, um, I've so far kind of glossed over the uh, authorization authentication piece. Uh, so I'm gonna go into it a little bit uh, with the time I have. I can't actually see how much time I have. I guess I need better glasses. Uh, the, um, so I'm gonna take the two pieces separately because it's important to make the distinction. Uh, and so the idea being, right, authentication is knowing who somebody is and authorization is knowing what they can do. So those are two separate concerns and they're gonna be implement, they're implemented by separate parts of the system, right? So an authentication plugin is just some, gonna be something that can literally tell you which, which user ID somebody is based on their authenticators, right? So you know, OAuth 2 is a pretty solid choice to be able to integrate and take advantage of some of the existing stuff in the community around like Ember Simple Auth, Tori, um, to expose both to the server and to the code running in the Ember app, 
uh, like who is this user, right? How, who really wants to spend another day working on that stuff in your app, right? When like you really don't need anything that special. Um, the few, if there's a few special things you need, great. Extend your type, your type and just add a couple of few fields that are unique to you. Um, the second piece is the authorization piece, and this is where uh, a lot of ambitious projects in larger organizations stumble because it's hard to get right, and it's be and because every system th wants to have its own opinions about author authorization, and you really want to build a holistic experience, right? You really want to pull together everything about a particular customer, about a particular product, about a particular experience that was important to someone. You want to pull them all from different data sources and put them all together. The user doesn't care what database it came from. And so to build those fused experiences, you really need a fused kind of server that has a holistic view across things. Um, implementing authorization is actually a great, reason, a great example of that because a lot of times, um, you know, nobody wants to go, and especially in it, say like, um, uh, there was a screenshot I meant to take, which is, and I, I think I tweeted it a while ago, but it was basically uh, shaming a, a large bank for having like nine login buttons on their, on one of their screens, because they had like nine enterprise systems that never talked to each other. So you, the customer, had to figure out which one to click on to log in, right? Like that's, nobody wants to be there. Uh, it's really easy to be there by default unless you do something. So the authorization system here is very deliberately built into the hub, and the goal is that the hub actually has to be trusted. The, the hub, you give it credentials to get to all your data sources, and the hub implement, implements your actual end user author, authorization. And, it, and uh, if you look at the stuff that's already published out there in the crowdstack.org, um, it's got a pretty good first implementation of all the right authorities for writing to content, um, both at the content type level and at the field level. So you can have, you can define rules about having certain fields that people can't edit or even see, and like, all, the things you, all the things that might have pushed you to say, I, I can't really make this stock, I have a little bit of something special. Um, the goal is to not have to have that. Or, and, and that when you do, the way you solve it is not to have to sit down and um, like spin up a whole server, it's to drop in a new plugin. And, that the, and the pitch of that is it's gonna be easier to do it in a plugin anyway, and now once you've done it in a plugin, like let's share it with the community, and now nobody else has to do that one. Right. So again, it's a very familiar pitch to Ember. Uh, that's the whole name of the game, and so this is all about moving up that spectrum. Now, when we talk about the spectrum of small apps and big apps, and small capabilities and big capabilities, um, you know, we are, we're, we're, we're talking about a trade-off, of course, right? We, we know that like, more features cost more code and they're harder to build. But there are some really interesting ways that you can cheat uh, or like bend the curve. And one example of that is that you can build very sophisticated applications using this kind of infrastructure to manage things like your rich library of content. But because we've, Ember's got such great uh, build capabilities, you can actually, as the final output, spit out you know, very tiny focused pieces of content to be seen by your end users. So one of the things that, uh, one of the things I didn't get to in the actual videos is that um, we have the concept of formats for your content, right? We, we, we were working in a page format, so there was a speaker page, and the component was named speaker-page. But you can have more formats, and out of the box there's a card format as well, so a speaker card is a card format that you can render among many in a, in a grid or you can you know, style it how you want. It doesn't have to look blocky, right? Card really just is a, a physically, it's something, something with a physical analogy that you can, users can really get a sense for. Um, that card that renders out of there could very well be a Glimmer component, right? It could render out to a web component that gets embedded lots of places. It could render out to an, a Facebook ad. It could render out to a text message, right? So this is not wedded to one channel. Um, you really want the full powers of Ember plus Cardstack to do rich editing experiences. This is the, like it's this, this is the area where Ember has already shone, and we want to bring that to more people. Uh, but the pitch is that you can also use that to then generate content that goes out all the way down to the glimmer end of the spectrum. Uh, and we have actual proofs of concept of that. If you any of you got to catch uh, Tom Dale's talk at Wikigood Ember, he demoed a product that does that already. And um, they're, who they're at Monograph, who are very excited to be reintegrating Glimmer. Uh, into that product, and also working on the card stuff. So this stuff is all actually happening, and it's a very exciting, uh, very exciting to be able to push both directions on the continuum. So that's the that's the huge opportunity for Ember. So wrapping up, uh, some coming attractions. M mo most of this stuff actually is code that works already, and need, just needs the the love and care to extract it correctly. 
you know, framework thinking is very different from app thinking. It, you definitely need to take your time and do it well. So, but all of this stuff is going through the same process of the other things I already showed that are already extracted. So card stack search is really critical. I haven't really talked yet about how the goal of this whole system is to be a 100% search driven uh, sites. But the, the point of that is that everything is really a search. Um, the more traditional LAMP stack way to build websites was everything was kind of an SQL query. And you can only go so, in, and I'm a big fan of queries and structure, but it turns out what you mostly want on the web is much more fuzzy, much more rich ways of deciding how to rank content, where to put it. Uh, and so having that full capability of anywhere you go on your site is pretty powerful. So for example, if you got a feature request to say, like, let's make a sidebar with the top 10 featured products from today, you say, no problem, I'll drop in a card stack search component there. And as an input, it takes a query, and a query is just a field, and there's a field editor that knows how to edit queries. So the, what, now, the, now the, the owner of that actual product can go and change their query as they want to. You don't have to deal with that anymore, right? So the goal is, again, to draw more people into the experience, get more, in, more interaction happening in your, in your organization, get more people par directly participating. You can give these tools out more widely, and everybody benefits, right? You don't really want to be the one who has to deal with the, the planning meetings and the feature requests to say, like, can we change the priority of this slightly higher than that? Like, isn't it great if you can say, guess what? I built you a plugin that now lets you edit that directly, right? That's the pitch. So that's the card stack search feature. Uh, card stack models is the idea that you shouldn't have to write the Ember data models for these things because you're already defining all their schema very explicitly. We know what their types are, we know what their rules are, we know what their relationships are. And so the goal is to have a, a, um, a build time step that actually just makes sure that you have Ember data models in your app, right? You shouldn't, the, 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 the real goal we're driving toward here is apps that are templates and plugins. And you only need to dive into JavaScript when you're doing something that's really special. Um, simply rendering a model is not that special, right? Being able to just, you know, how unique are your field types really, right? Maybe you have one or two that you might need to write a plugin for, but a lot of them are things that the community has already written. Uh, and so this is all about liberating those things that are already out there and making them work. Uh, simultaneous preview of multiple content formats, right? So when you're, edit, when you're actually in the experience of making content, it's really nice to be able to see the card form, see the page form, see the phone form, see the, you know, whatever your imagination brings to you. Um, that's a really easy thing to do, right? I, I don't, you may have noticed in the card stack content component, it just takes format as an argument. You can flip it, and all of a sudden your content renders in a whole new way. Um, Ember CLI deploy integrations, right? This thing only works if people can actually ship sites on it without diving into the code, and that's actually a whole other art. And uh, you know, major props to Ember CLI deploy because in this community we've already got codified experience on best practices of deploying all kinds of stuff. And so we absolutely need to have deploy packs that will take this whole suite and just send it out to the cloud. Uh, more field types, I talked about some of those already. More data sources, some of these are also ones I've talked about. These, one, these are some that exist, like we do have SQL server integrations, we have a Drupal integration. Um, Whatever, what is that legacy system that keeps you up at night in your organization, right? Uh, that you hope you don't have to deal with, right? That's the one that you really want to suck in through the hub so that you can all of a sudden liberate that data and expose it to your application in an idiomatic way on a very fast API. All you have to do is make sure you can index it near real time, you know, as much as, as best as your requirements dictate into the hub. Um, and finally, card stack desktop. The goal of that is, is, a, uh, is to make sure you know, all these steps that I showed you, there was a lot of Ember add steps, right? Uh, simply by requiring people to go to the, the terminal to do that, you, you cut off a certain audience who are just not comfortable with that. We really want to get to the point where you can download a desktop app that is running all the same stuff under it. Um, Ember Hearth is a great example of an early pilot of this kind of capability where they can actually wrap up Ember CLI in a desktop experience. Uh, we want to push that much further. A lot of the things that I already showed you dovetail with that because the kind of things you would need to set up that desktop tool are the things that already exist in your site. So it's a very fuzzy boundary between when am I actually like in my site live editing stuff on the site versus doing it locally. Awful lot of things can happen right on the site. Um, you know, you're not gonna add new plugins that way, maybe, maybe eventually you will. Maybe you'll actually like log into your site, tell it to NPM, NPM install new things. That's pretty powerful. Um, but there's still things today that you would want to do locally, especially if you're going to do like, you're going to do wholesale changes to your search index, right? Like that's a fairly expensive thing to just do on a whim on a branch. So you might want to do it locally. And we want to make that easy to do. So, eye on the goal, 
happy Ember devs who can add all these sophisticated things to their apps at much lower effort. Um, and a just works experience for a new set of users who today can't really use Ember, right? T today it would be almost irresponsible for some organizations to, to do it. I had a great uh, conversation with some of the guys from 201 Created where they said, you know, we did a, a one day hackathon for a local charity and they were gonna make a website for them. And it's like really hard to say Ember's a good choice there right now because it is a little irresponsible because they can't, they don't have the people and the skills to go and take care of an Ember app because it's too hard today, right? So what you do if you have one day is you set up a WordPress app for them, right? I want this to be something that they, you could actually set up for them. That's the new audience, right? And it's way bigger than just small organizations because the Drupals of the world and the WordPress of the world are up and down the continuum of size from national governments to tiny schools uh, because there's comp it's compelling, right? More features is compelling. That should be kind of a, a, a tautology. Uh, and, and it creates a, a community with a continuum of schools, skills that gives people pathways to level up when everybody's collaborating in one project. So it's critical that this whole continuum exists. It's the only way you actually get one of these ecosystems rolling. Uh, if you build a tool that's just for newbies and it feels too much like a toy, and all of us in this room don't actually use it, you never get the plugins that make it fly, right? Software is fundamentally hard. This isn't about saying people won't have to write software anymore, it won't be hard. Uh, you know, since like when Fred Brooks wrote No Silver Bullet in 1986, we've known software has essential complexity to it, and that there's things that are always hard. So even though we try to whittle down the accidental complexities as much as we can, there's a limit to how far we can go. So uh, that's why the only, the only cheat around the no silver bullet problem, which he also pointed out long ago, is reuse. Right? The only way to go farther in software is to have many of the pieces you need already there. And so that's the name of the game. That's the only way we, over the long run, make software empower more people. So it's impossible to ship all this ambitious stuff without you. It has already been, it already would have been impossible to go as far as we've had, and thank you to everyone who's contributed to the hundreds of individual projects that make all this possible. Um, we need you still, and we need more of that, so if you're excited by these ideas, come talk to me. We've got lots of interesting stuff to work on. Uh, let's empower the next million creators. Thank you.